Once again today we greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We appreciate your presence here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We have quite a few visitors. We're glad you came to be with us here at Northside today. May God bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Some of you are here with your fathers. We appreciate that. Today is the Lord's Day number one. It's Father's Day number two. Now, if you're a father out there in the radio listening audience and you are saved and you should be in your church and you allowed this day to keep you at home, allowed your children to keep you at home, or you stayed there on your own, you dishonored your fathers. You dishonored the Father's Day. The way to honor the Father's Day, honor God first and then the fathers. But if you dishonored God to honor the fathers, then of course you have dishonored yourself on this day. But we appreciate you that are here. May God bless you. And we're looking forward to a good hour together. Now the singing and the message will be on cassette tape number 274. 274 is the number of the tape today. And it's available. You out in the radio listen audience, if you write in and request tape number 274, I'm going to speak on the subject, what our fathers believed. And so you write in for the tape by number, by title. They're $3 each, and then, of course, the $3 is used to help defray our radio expense. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Now, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune to the station where you're now listening, at 12 o'clock noon each day, you can pick up the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday. I hope you're doing that. I meet quite a few people say, Preach Edwards, I'm eating lunch in my truck or on the job or someplace at that time, and we'll always tune in and get the daily broadcast, and we appreciate that very much. I do have a list of about 260-some odd of my cassette tape. If you'd like to have a list of my tape, write in. I'll send you a list, and then you can choose the ones that you'd like to have and write in for them. And I want you to remember us in prayer. You know, when we call in names in respect to our dear members that are sick, we always leave somebody out. And so we left out Sister Sue Sara today that's, that's uh, recuperating from uh, a broken hip at home, and I hope she'll soon be strong again and able to go. And any other of our members... We have left you out and failed to mention you because of the absence, because of the illness. We're sorry about it. Take your Bible today and turn to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, chapter 23, and chapter 17. And then I want to read a verse or two from the book of Jude. Proverbs, chapter 4. And I want to read uh, verse 1, I believe it is. So you turn there in your Bible. And let's see what it says in Proverbs 4.1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. See, your father's father and mother brought you up, so don't you let them down. All right. Now in uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 22 and 24, I want to read a verse or two of Scripture here. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 22 and 24. Hearken unto the father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. And then in verse 24, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begins a wise child shall have joy of him. One other verse of scripture in the book of Proverbs. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 17 for a verse of scripture, and it's verse 6. I want you to get this one. 17 and verse 6. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. Now turn to the little epistle of Jude way over in the back of the New Testament, right next to the book of Revelation, and let me read about four verses. Then I'm going to speak on the subject, what our fathers believe. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father 
and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of all ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if there's ever been a time when we need some good, strong, Bible-believing fathers, it's in this day in which we live. I know you realize that. I have a little clip in here. It says, A Christian Father's Ten Commandments. Thou shalt hold no other group more important than the family unit in all thy ways. Be faithful to it. Thou shalt teach thy sons and daughters to love, respect, and obey their parents. Thou shalt be a loving and considerate husband. Thou shalt not speak in a manner unbecoming to a Christian gentleman. Thou shalt make Sunday a day set aside for God and worship as a family. Thou shalt provide for the family, spiritually and physically. Thou shalt promote and lead family worship in thy house. Thou shalt be honest in all thy dealings. Thou shalt respect the desires and freedom of thy family as individuals. Thou shalt be the head of thy household while ruling it with love. Those are the Ten Commandments a Christian Father's Ten Commandments. I just want to pass them on to you. Now we're living in a day where we need some great giants in God, some great fathers that stand for the Lord. I'll tell you, it's, it's a sad hour and a sad day whenever our judicial system's in the shape it's in today, whenever you can select a jury along racial lines and then acquit a man in cold-blooded murder that's committed cold-blooded murder, and then turn around and talk about uh, making a movie of the situation and uh, setting him on high and things of that type. I'll tell you, it's a sad hour, and things like that are happening. Some of the crooked lawyers today, or whenever they're appointing the jury, they always do that, many of them, wrong racial lines because they know what they intend to do. And many times the district attorney is in on, on it as well because he allows some of that to happen, and then they place in the jury box uh, people along the racial lines in order to get the job done. And sometimes it's almost solid along racial lines, and that's bad. And then they acquit uh, cold-blooded murders and turn them loose and then praise them highly and talk about writing a book and making a movie of criminals like that, ungodly men, cold-blooded murders. Now, that's a situation we're facing today, and it's getting worse all the time. And I feel sorry today for anybody that's killed by a wicked uh, criminal or some law enforcement officer that's killed by somebody he's trying to arrest. I feel sorry for him because we don't have much in encouragement for him, much help for him. Because when you get a bunch of crooked lawyers and sometimes crooked judges and weak-kneed juries that go along, uh, according to the wishes of the crooked lawyers and acquit men like that, I feel sorry for the poor victim. And not only that, the Supreme Court, the liberal wing of the Supreme Court last week, uh, made a ruling in favor of the criminal when they said you cannot refer to the suffering of the family of the criminal, the criminal's family, when you're trying somebody anymore. In other words, the lawyer can't say that family suffered the loss of loved one or they were hurt or deprived or the victim was or suffered while being put to death. You can't mention that to the jury anymore. The liberal wing of the Supreme Court last week made that ruling that you can't do that anymore. That's all in favor of the criminal and it's against the law-abiding citizen and families that love God and appreciate the Bible and love the Lord. And the liberal Supreme Court is moving in that direction, been doing that for many years. And unless we can get some conservatives on the beach that will turn that trend, then we're still in bad shape. And not only that, they made another ruling that you can teach the theory of evolution in school, but you can't say in school it's not true. You cannot take a stand against it and say that we came here by a direct creation of God. Now, you can teach in schools today that man came from a monkey or an ape or a tadpole, and in that school, you can't say that is not true. You can't say God created us. That's wrong. You can't do that. The Supreme Court said that last week in regard to this case that came out of uh, St. Louis, I believe, 
and that's bad too. So they made those two bad moves next week, or last week rather, uh, the Supreme Court did. And it's sad that we have a court that'll do a thing like that, rule against God, and rule against the Bible, and rule against law-abiding citizens, and rule against plain common sense. But that's what the liberals are doing today. The American Cranky Lunatic Union is behind it 100%, and they're pushing these things, and that is sad and sad indeed. Now it's my business to inform you, let you know where we stand, what is right, what is wrong, and as your pastor, I intend to do that as long as God lets me live. Now, that's not my message. That's only the introduction. I'm going to speak today on what our fathers believed, and I, some, I may be like a racehorse today, but, but follow me if you can, as I move through some of the things that our great fathers believed in, and some of our great fathers believe in today. Number one, let's notice that our fathers believed what they believed about the Bible. Our fathers believe the Bible is the divine revelation of God unto men. They believe that. Our fathers believe that it is inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. Our fathers believe that. They believe it was written in old time by men of God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21. They believe that the word of God is ever settled in heaven. They believe it, it's a living and abiding forever. It liveth and abideth forever. They believe it is the greatest book ever written and will never be equal. They believe it is the book to live by and to die by. Now our fathers believe that. Our great men that founded this nation believe that. Great fathers believe that. They believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant word of God. You know the wrangle they had out last week. I believe that was in St. Louis. I may have made a mistake about the ruling that came uh, uh, from St. Louis a moment ago. But anyway, when they had the meeting, the Southern Baptist Convention had their meeting. And, and of course, they fuss and growl and quarrel around out there. And finally, what they called the fundamentalists won out. And then the liberals that called themselves the moderates, they, um, they got uh, whipped out this time. And, and they didn't like it. And, and of course, um, uh, they, some of them marched off to the sea. And then whenever the fundamentalists won out, and then Billy Graham got up and said, we have won. What about that? We have won, said Billy Graham. And so he claimed to be on the side of the fundamentalists. But anyway, people that don't believe this Bible here is the inerrant, infallible word of God has got no business standing behind the sacred desk and calling himself a preacher. And those people that call themselves moderates, which are liberals, I don't know why they're ashamed of the title. Why don't they go ahead and say we are liberals and saying we, we're the moderates. They are outright liberals and they don't believe this book to be the inerrant, infallible word of God. And they fuss and quarrel about it. And after the meeting was over, during the, the time of the closing of the meeting, then the so-called fundamentalists, they hugged up the liberals and said, now we need to be brothering and cooperate together and work together and do a job for the Southern Baptist Convention. What a shame. That's the reason I'm an old-fashioned, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist, brother. I can't go along with that kind of stuff and support modernism and liberalism in the seminaries and schools and support those professors that do not believe this book to be the infallible Word of God. This is God's book, God's Word, God breathed, and I believe that as long as I live. It is the Word of God. Our fathers believed that. Secondly, notice what our fathers believed about God. Our fathers believed in a personal God. Secondly, they believe he was the holy, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. They believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believe the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. They believe that uh, according to their testimony, what they stood for, as they stood for the truth of God. They believe these things. And then we notice something else that they believe here. They, they, our fathers believe what they believe about Satan, number three. What our fathers believed about Satan. Our fathers believed in a personal devil. Now I believe in a personal devil, don't you? There were two little boys out playing one time. And one boy, little boy said to the other, said, Do you believe there's a, a, a real personal devil? Little fellow said, No, I don't believe that. Said, Really, it's, your, it's like that Santa Claus business. It's really your daddy if you want to know the truth. Well, we believe in a personal devil. 
There is a devil to contend with, and, and if you're a Christian, you ought to know there's a devil. And he's certainly working against you in every way possible. They believe he's the God of this age, God of the world system. That's why we're in the mess we're in in the world today. The devil is a God of this world system. They believe he's limited and destined for the lake of fire. We believe that, don't we? The devil is headed for the lake of fire. The Bible said so. They believe he's against everything God is for and against the people of God. We believe that. They believe he is behind all the evils of the world. Our fathers believe that. You'd be surprised today at the people in the world that don't believe there's a personal devil. But there is a personal devil. You know that and I know that. I didn't think much about it until God saved me. But after God saved me, I found out there is a devil to contend with. And if you're trying to do this thing for God, you'll have to admit there's a devil to contend with. And he's going to be on your heels. Now, if you're not doing anything for God, then he'll let you alone. He won't bother you. But if you move out for God, then he's after you as certain as the world. Number four, let's notice what our fathers believed about man. They believe that man is a trinity. He has a body, soul, and spirit. Our fathers believe that. They believe that man was expelled from the Garden of Eden because of sin. That's exactly what happened. God expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden because of sin. They believe that man is born in sin. David said so in Psalms chapter 51 and verse 5, that man is born in sin. The Bible tells us that. They believe that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible teaches. Our fathers believe that. Everybody, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Only one perfect person ever lived and this world crucified him. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe that man must be redeemed. Now you just can't go out and reform, turn over a new leaf, decide to do better, or try to uh, educate yourself, or millerate yourself into the family of God. You can't do that. Beloved, you must be redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Simon Peter said, we're redeemed with that precious blood, not by silver or gold, but by his precious blood we are redeemed, bought with that price. Our fathers believed that, our forefathers, the men that founded this nation, the men that came to this country from over in Europe and came here on their knees with the word of God in their hands, came over here to found a nation and worship God according to this Bible. They believed that. And so that's what our fathers believed, what we should believe today. Number five, let's notice what our fathers believed about sin. Our fathers believe that sin is wrong and sin is called missing the mark. Missing the mark. Sin is sin and sin is wrong. Our fathers believe that. They believe that sin wrecks. Now you know that, I know that. I've never seen a time, and you haven't either, when there's so many of our young people being killed out on the highways. Just about every morning when you turn the news on, you're going to read where a young a couple, young boys and girls, out on the highway, drinking and driving, crossed over the center line, hit somebody head on, and killed somebody, or got killed themselves. It's happening every day. Our young people slaughtering themselves out on the highway. Sin wrecks, sin runs, sin runs the lives of our young people. That's why we say our young people should uh, not take dope or drink alcoholic beverages or smoke cigarettes or do anything that would damage your body. Stay clean, pure, and holy, and you'll be glad that you did ere you move on down life's highway. They believe that sin wrecks. They believe that sin mars. A lot of people, they mars, marred in sin. As they show on the TV many times, many of these homosexuals, they show them and they're terrible looking creatures, many of them. And many of these prostitutes, terrible looking creatures. You can tell they've been terribly marred by sin. And we know what sin will do for us. They believe the wages of sin is death. Our forefathers believed that. The wages of sin is death. They believed that the blood was the only remedy for sin. And the Bible tells us the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin. Our forefathers believe that. Now these infidels, these liberals, these modernists today, they deny the blood. They don't believe in the blood atonement. They don't believe in the cleansing of the blood of Jesus Christ. They deny that. They want to take it out of the hymnals. They want to take it out of the Bibles. That's why they have all these new translations. They want to do away with the blood and get away from the blood. But you can't do that. 
The bloodstream runs all the way through the Bible. And it was God's blood that redeemed us when Jesus died on the cross. He paid for our sins, not with silver, not with gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb, without spot and without blemish. So it's the blood that counts. If you deny the blood, you have denied the Word of God. If you take the blood out of the Bible, you might as well throw your Bible away. Our fathers believed in the blood, and you'd do well to do so. Number six, let's notice what our fathers believed about salvation. First of all, they believed it was man's deepest need. I don't know anything that's any greater need for mankind today than salvation to you. I'm not talking about religions. You have two major religions in the world today. You have real true Christianity and then you have religion by works. And all false religions and cults are based upon works and good deeds and so forth. But you have the true salvation of God. You can call it religion if you want to, but it's the true salvation of God and it's man's deepest needs. Man needs salvation, not religion, not reformation, he needs salvation. And salvation is of the Lord. They bleed was of the Lord. In Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. And when he made that statement that a fish couldn't contain that Baptist preacher any long and regurgitated, and out he went on dry ground. Now Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. I believe that, don't you? Salvation is of God in its origination, it's of God in its application, it's of God in its effectuation, it's of God in its consummation. Salvation is entirely of the Lord, not of man, but of God. And if you're saved, you're saved by the power of God. It's God's salvation, God's imputed righteousness that God gave unto you, that God birthed you into his family. It's all of the Lord. There's no way you can work your way into heaven, no way you can be good enough, no way you can buy your way in. It's entirely of God. You're either saved by the Lord, by his marvelous power and precious blood, or you'll die and go to hell. No other way to make it. And they believe that salvation is the Lord. They believe it was planned before the foundation of the world. Now, whenever man sinned, uh, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost didn't get together and say, Now, wait a minute here. Man slipped up down there, and we need to work out some plan whereby he can get back in. No, no. God planned salvation before the foundation of the world. Before God ever placed Adam in that garden and placed Eve by his side, God had already worked out a plan of salvation. And that salvation is in Jesus Christ. God worked it out before the foundation of the world. And they believed it was offered to man through the gospel. Whenever you preach the gospel, salvation is offered to mankind. You can be saved by repenting and believing in Christ. Salvation is of the Lord. They believe that others must be told about it through God's people. They believe that. But people know about salvation, know about Jesus Christ, know how to be saved. It must be told to people through ministers, missionaries, deacons, singers, workers, and Christians. That's God's plan to get out the message and let people know they need to be saved. Quite often I run into someone that say, Preacher Edwards, my mother listened to you for years, and uh, maybe I got saved uh, by means of listening to your broadcast when I heard the gospel. And sometimes I run into people about 75, 80 years old that say, Preach Edwards, I've listened to you since I was a little girl. Well, that's all right as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, just so they listen. I'm glad they listen. Well, they've been listening 40, 50, 70, 100 years. If they want to believe that, I, that's up to them. But I haven't been preaching on the radio but about uh, in my 39th year daily. And so if you go above 39 years, then you weren't listening to me, I don't think. You might have been listening to someone else. And they believe the gospel must be spread that way. Then number seven, our fathers believe what, what they believe about hell. Let's see what they believe about hell. They believed in hell. Now, a lot of people like to deny hell today and explain hell away, but they believed in hell. They believed that hell is literal. They believed that all sinners would go to hell if they die without Jesus Christ. Our fathers believed that hell is a place of fire. That's what Jesus said in the Bible. They believed that hell is a place of torment. Jesus said so in the word of God. They believed that hell is a place of no escape. That's what the Lord said. And they believed that sinners should be warned about hell. And so we need to warn people about hell lest they go into the awful place of torment, uh, so saith the Bible. 
And so they believed in hell, and you'd do well to believe in hell yourself. Now, I believe if we had more hell fire preached in the pulpit, we'd have less hell out in the pew. Don't you believe that? We need to get the pulpit on fire to preach, preach hell fire and damnation. A lot of the liberals, infidels, and modernists today, they don't talk about hell anymore. If they're referred to it, they kind of say, well, there's a place, uh, somebody mentioned a place called Hades. Well, we need to let them know that hell is hell and a place of fire and where sinners go that die without God. And so they believe that hell is a place where sinners go that die without Jesus Christ. Then uh, number eight, let's notice what our fathers believed about heaven. They believe that heaven is real. I believe that, don't you? Heaven is real. They made a lot of surveys in many colleges and universities to check up on what people believe about hell and heaven and, and the resurrection and the new birth. You'd be surprised how few college students today on many campuses that believe in the, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, that believe in hell, or that believe in heaven, that believe that man is a sinful creature. Very few of them believe that because they've been taught by the infidels and liberals and they don't believe that anymore, and that's bad. Now, we need to believe there's a heaven. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. They believe that heaven is a place where God's people will go at death. I believe that with all my heart. I have a precious mother and dad. Today, I believe they're in heaven. And I believe I'll see them someday. And now you have loved ones in heaven. They believe that heaven is a place of rest and peace on the other side. Our fathers believe that. And I believe that. They believe that heaven is where God is. And I believe that. They believe that heaven is a place where angels are. I believe that. They believe that heaven is a place where our loved ones have gone. I believe that, don't you? And they believe that heaven is our eternal home. They believe these things. I'm talking about our fathers. They believe these things, and I believe them, and I hope you believe them. Now, I have here a little clipping. Let me read a paragraph or so from it because it's so very touching, and we need to realize these things before it's everlasting it's too late. Now, out in Texas, uh, some time ago in Electra, Texas, let me read, I quote, Many years ago near Electra, Texas, an oil well was being dug. It was 180 feet deep and 12 inches wide. During the digging, a child fell into the well from the depths, fell in the well. From the depths below, the child's pitiful plea could be heard. Daddy, get me out. Ropes were tied to the father's body. An effort was made to lower him into the narrow well, but to no avail. Other efforts were made to rescue the child, but all ended in failure. Fainter and fainter, the child's plea was heard. Daddy, get me out. Daddy, get me out. The cry finally ceased. Later, with grab hooks, they brought the, to surface the lifeless body of the little child. Strong men who had been able to rescue the child sat down and wept. Isn't that sad? That actually happened out in Texas. I remember when it happened a few years ago. But I'm going to tell you something worse than that. Some of you fathers are letting your children fall into a well of sin a place they need to be delivered from. And if you don't help them to God or get them to church or do what you can to keep them out of hell, one of these days they'll die. They'll cry, Daddy, I wish you could get me out. Daddy, if you'd have told me the truth, I wouldn't have been here. Fathers have a great responsibility today, and we need to realize that. Our children many times will follow our footsteps. There's a man one time headed toward the, the beer saloon, and there was snow on the ground. He heard something behind him. He looked behind. There came his little boy stepping in his tracks. The boy said, Daddy, I'm, I'm stepping in your tracks. And the man stopped. He said, where am I going? I'm headed down to the beer saloon where there's curses and drinkers and gamblers. And here my little boy is following me to the beer saloon. He said, I'm playing the fool. He turned around, he picked that little fellow up in his arms, and he went back home. He said, I'm not going to lead my boy to the beer saloon. And there's a many of a dad today that's neglected their children, won't take them to church, won't give them a chance to get the gospel, won't talk with them about God, won't get right with God themselves. And one of these days, if those children die and go to hell, they'll lift their finger in their dad's face and said. You're the blame for me being here. This and I close. I heard Jess Henley tell this, and it's a true story. Jess Henley said here in Atlanta, there was a, 
teenage boy and a teenage girl. The mother was a Christian woman. The dad was a weakened man. That little girl followed a mother, got saved, lived for God. That boy followed his dad, went out into sin. They contracted terrible venereal disease, brought to the hospital. Dad went in to see him. He's on his dying bed. When dad walked in, he raised that old bony finger and said, Daddy, Daddy, I followed your footsteps. And said, that's the reason I'm dying. And so I'm dying and going to hell. And you're to blame for it. And that boy died and went to hell. Wouldn't it be awful to have your son to point his finger in your face and say, Daddy, if you would have helped me and told me the truth and done right, I wouldn't be in hell today. What responsibility we have. Oh, you fathers, greater and greater becomes your responsibility every day that you live upon this earth. And you need to realize that. Do your best to get your family in. God expects you to do it. You should do it. God's holding you responsible. And you ought to do it. And those little tots come along. Time they're big enough to crawl. Begin to plan to get them to God and get them in the church and get them in the Bible and get them into heaven. You ought to do it. You dads are responsible. Don't let your family die and go to hell. Let's stand to our feet. Heads bowed and eyes closed while Debbie plays the coupler stanzas on the organ. Now you listen to me now. Listen closely. I want to help you. If you're here today and you're unsaved, you ought to come to God. If you're an unsaved daddy today, a father, you ought to get right with God. You may lead your own children.